Hello, welcome. We're here today with uh, Paul Collier. He's Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the University of Oxford, Blavatnik School of Government, and a professional fellow at St. Anthony's College. He's also been Director of the Research Development Department at the World Bank. Um, and it's hard to say which one is my favorite of your three books, uh, The Bottom Billion, Exodus, and The Future of Capitalism. These are at least my three favorites. So uh, welcome. How are you, Paul? Professor, nice to see you. Thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me on. Um, so, uh, you know, first of all, how are you? I understand you've been, part of your family has been through coronavirus, and these days you are also well into the difficulties of both homeschooling and home teaching like everyone else. That's right. It's a hard life, uh, um, but not as hard for me as, as for my wife, because she got coronavirus quite badly, and then that morphed into a blood clot on the lungs, which is quite serious. So that's been tough um, and we've got two hyperactive kids um, and homeschooling is uh, you know is, is, is quite challenging would be the word <laughs> yeah I know we are we all are going through uh, new times and new challenges so. yeah I just hope they don't burst into this room uh, <laughs> about their recording but, uh, but but you know yeah so um, and that the big advantage for me is I'm not traveling anywhere and so uh, um, Actually, it's improved my health, uh, worse than everybody else's, but I feel fit as a fiddle. Yeah, it's, it's quite a new world uh, for world travelers like, like we were before doing yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and how is the situation in Britain? At the beginning, the government, they say, uh, heard the immunity approach, but then it abandoned it. Um, is this the explanation for its high death rate relative to others, though others that have done equally bad? I mean... Policy hasn't been very impressive. It, um, it, it made, I think, two big mistakes. Um, though mistakes are in the nature of this problem. Right? The whole, what we're faced with uh, is what's called radical uncertainty, where there is no model that tells us what to do. Um, and so we've got to learn as we go, and in particular, learn from others where the diseases happen first. And that was the first of Britain's mistakes. Um, we should have learned from East Asia. We should have learned from Italy, both of which had the disease before it reached Britain. Um, and instead, um, the governments are all relying on the science, as if there's such a thing as the science. The science turned, up to, turned out to be one model um, in one university. And um, that model, what, what the modelers should have said was we don't know enough about this disease to be able to specify the key parameters in this model. And until we can do that, we can't use the model to predict anything. Um, and instead, they made up the numbers, stuck them in, and came out with various dramatic recommendations, the first of which was um, herd immunity. And the, the, there was another big mistake we made conceptually, which was um, always when you're faced with the unknown, you reach for the nearest equivalent historical experience. And it's fascinating that in, in the world, there have been four such historical experiences going on in parallel. In East Asia, they said, oh, this is another SARS. Now, fortunately for them, SARS was pretty serious, pretty contagious, so they took it seriously. In Europe and North America, what did we say? Oh, it's Spanish flu again. <laughs> Spanish flu had happened a long time ago and was anyway just flu. And so that's the sort of mentality that produced, oh, get herd immunity. We're all going to get it. We'll, you know, it's uh, snuffles or sniffles or whatever that um, guy who is uh, making a mess of um, Brazil um, described it as. Um, in Africa, which a lot of my work's in Africa, in West Africa, they said, oh, this is another Ebola. And that was pretty helpful because whatever Ebola had been, it had been deathly. And so they knew we've got to change our behaviors here. And in Southern Africa, they said, oh, it's another AIDS. And that was deadly. And so 
that was the first of not just Britain's, but of Europe and North America's mistakes. We said, oh, it's another flu. Uh, and then, um, having got this uh, sort of mentality of herd immunity, of not learning from others, we then over-relied on this one damn model. Now, of course, um, there are lots of models all saying different things. Um, and none of them are right. Um, and so the really important lesson of radical uncertainty is um, learn from others and work it out as you go. And so decentralize and learn from practitioner experience as you go. And bring the population up to speed so that individual people can actually take sensible decisions. We didn't do it. <laughs> so it's kind of a tragedy that it, this is a crisis in which both politicians and scientists have kind of failed in in, in steering it through. And and if I read your your writings on Corona, right, you're kind of giving three advices, which are test, test, and test. Is that right? Certainly, that's a, a very important part of it. Yeah, um, um, facing radical uncertainty, you really need to learn as you go. You know, radical uncertainty means we don't know. There are known unknowns, that is, things we know we ought to know, but don't. Well, then the lesson is find out. And there are unknown unknowns. Things are going to hit. It's such a big shock that things will hit that we can't even properly anticipate. Um, you know, what will quite possibly consumption patterns will change quite a lot as a result of this experience of living in lockdown. You know, I think um, uh, the age of everybody commuting into megacities, I think that's going to be questioned. A lot of people have discovered um, it's much nicer um, not to have to commute into a big city every day. Do we really need all that? Can't we use Zoom like we're using it? Not all the time, but for some things, do we need to have to be in those offices, um, you know, so many hours each week? Probably not. But that will produce all sorts of changes, which we, again, we can't predict really either how big those changes will be or what they'll be. Yeah, there are countries which have gone for a very centralized and central kind of command model of steering through the crisis. But in, in some of your writings, you're also uh, advising to that if you want to increase your resilience, in fact, you should go decentralized and you should uh, uh, operate in a kind of a network uh, with capabilities uh, along all the network rather than in central government. But there are some people, you know, so there is this debate about whether we need more government, more central government, or less in this state. Do you think we're going to get more state or less state or more centralized powers or less throughout this uh, crisis? I hope we don't get more centralized state. Um, uh, centralized states have really got stretched beyond their core competence. Britain more than almost any other high-income country. We're the most centralized major country in the world. Um, and so far too, but Whitehall in London, where the civil service and the politicians are, is so distant from real experience in the rest of the country that if you've got to learn as you go, I don't know what you have to do if you want to learn as you go. You've got to do many different, you've got to do experiment in parallel. Try this here, try that there. Centralized control is incapable of doing that. Huh? And then very rapidly, you've got to get feedback, what we call the tacit knowledge that comes from experience. It's much easier to share the expert codified knowledge that the center has, much easier to share that down the system than it is to share experience from Liverpool, Birmingham, Madrid, Barcelona, up the system. Huh? And so what you need is, is a system which pushes decisions, power of decision down, so people can try different things. You know, in Europe, we're very fortunate that Sweden's tried something completely different. We won't know whether that's been a good idea or a bad idea for three or four years. 
Um, but we learn that it's very good to have variation. Huh? We don't want standardization. We don't want this highly centralized um, structure. And there's one further effect that comes from a highly high centralization, which is all around the world, governments tend to suppress the information of their mistakes. The cock-up is followed by the cover-up, right? And in coronavirus, that turns out to be very, very important. There's some fascinating new work. It's not published yet. I just was sent it yesterday. This is a colleague of mine who's done it, Tim Besley. And um, what he's found is that quite systematically, um, the less democratic, the more centralized, controlled regimes uh, are reporting radically lower um, deaths and incidents of uh, coronavirus um, than um, it seems plausible from all the, when we know about when they first got contagion. Um, and that's part of a very familiar story. Um, uh, most originally um, pioneered by Amartya Sen uh, on the incidence of famines. Um, the best antidote against famine uh, is an open media that reports deaths. Uh, and so what we're actually getting with these high control centralized regimes is not um, a great success, it's great, sub great suppression of failure. Well, that's also in part why the Spanish flu was called the Spanish flu, because Spain was not under war and there was no military censorship, so the press could freely uh, talk I didn't about know. that. That's brilliant. That's yeah, brilliant. yeah. Example. There was no military censorship, whereas, you know, they, in other countries, they didn't want to demoralize population with the idea that there was a big pandemic hitting them. So, so this how we got the bad name. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that was both funny and, uh, and very pertinent. So, so, you know, we've looked at states. Let's look now at markets and then later maybe at societies. As for markets, um, you know, people are saying this is going to be, some people are saying this is the worst economic crisis in 100 years. It's going to be for sure deeper than the recession after 2008. I don't know if, if this is comparable to the 30s, but is, is this going to change in any substantial nature, how markets work, how capitalism work, how globalization works. Uh, every crisis we say we're going to reinvent capitalism and then nothing much happens. Do you see this time this is a game changer in terms of also markets? Um, well, it can be. Um, uh, as, as you implied, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the mere phenomenon of, a, of this sort of crisis Crisis can be used for needed change, um, but it can also just you know, go back to business as usual. Um, I think the, um, the acid test will be whether you get um, a move to uh, decentralization and greater inclusion of people in the economy. I think there's a a groundswell for both of those. Um, the inclusion because um, the people who are on the front line, the people who are doing the dying, the people who are actually keeping us afloat as societies are pretty badly paid, pretty you know, low income um, uh, people whose, whose jobs have never been celebrated. And suddenly they're important. And so that sense of togetherness um, is, I think, quite powerful. That's why trust in governments has risen a lot. Um, it's not that governments are doing a great job. Quite obviously, they're not. But we want to pull together. And so it's actually very easy for government to say, you know, here's what we all need to do. And even if it's wrong, um, we want to to come together in some common purpose. We've been very, very bad in recent years at forging any common purpose. And now there's, I think, a big appetite for it.
Yeah. Well, you also written to uh, about how um, a cholera outbreak um, in 1849. I remember very close to your hometown in Bradford. How, how that helped shaping a kind of um, uh, labor relations, communities getting together. It unleashed uh, big changes in terms of labor protection and, and so on. Do you think this also? is a time, as you were suggesting, in which uh, societies are coming together. But we also see, you know, societies that were very polarized and are being farther polarized uh, because of, of the crisis. Yeah, it, it, it can go either way. As you say, um, uh, in, in Bradford, um, uh, Titus Salt, the big businessman, um, he was the mayor at the time of cholera. His workers, his citizens were dying. And that, I think, was the impetus to his decision to give away his entire fortune. He was kind of the first Bill Gates. Um, and, uh, and just a few miles away, Rochdale, people came together and invented what became the World Cooperative Movement. Um, so I, I've just been reminded of that because I've got a new book coming out called Greed is Dead, um, jointly written with John Kay, and I've just got the proofs yesterday, so I was reading the proofs this morning of that, all that, that passage. Um, and so we certainly see um, uh, uh, a move beyond this sort of individualism and, um, uh, and mutual anger. Um, uh, it's been uh, a very ugly age of, um, of individualism uh, greed, outrage, um, and we're advocating communitarianism, and I think the age of communitarianism uh, is a, is actually upon us. I think gr what we what we mean by greed is dead, is that the intellectual foundations which sought to justify greed in terms of market fundamentalism, those intellectual foundations have collapsed. And so it's no longer going to be intellectually tenable to say greed is good or anything remotely like it. In fact, the whole idea of economic man, uh, which was the horrible creature conjured up by economics in the last 50 years, turns out to be fundamentally wrong. It's just not what humans are like. Humans are the most pro-social mammal of all the mammal species. We're very unusual, we're hardwired to care for each other, to cooperate, to build mutuality. Um, and we're not saints, but we do have this capacity for mutuality, much greater than any other species. And, um, and that can be harnessed. Of course, we can equally be driven into being greedy, selfish, lazy people, um, monitored, scrutinized, incentivized, all that crap. Um, it doesn't have to be like that, and it's not normal to be like that. So yeah, um, you got me worked up now, but yeah, I do think um, it will be possible to change. That's why we wrote the book. Okay, so we, we had to make that wish into a fact, like a, yes, the, the that's death of right. Greta. That's right, exactly. And it's a, it's a case of we can do it. You know, it's, it's moving from an I to a we, and, you know, Obama hit the right note. Yes, we can. And then he was able to say, yes, we did. Well, you know, we want to get back to that. Okay, let's uh, just look at uh, two places uh, which are also very close to you. One is Africa, then we can talk also a bit about the other big community, which is uh, Europe, or at least the attempt to build a, a community. Um, you know, we, we, we're looking at ourselves, of course, here in, across Europe, you know, we're hit by the uh, pandemic, but uh, are we forgetting uh, people out there that they are enduring these through, uh, you know, very difficult circumstances with less resilience, with more vulnerabilities. Are we failing them or are we failing all the people out there by just concentrating in ourselves? How is the situation in Africa, you know, it's so close? Yes, we are. And um, what we aren't sufficiently aware of is that the big hit to Africa isn't even coronavirus. 
has got that hit. Um, people are dying because they've got very weak health systems. Um, so it's got that hit. But the big hit uh, in Africa is economic, and it's coming from the uh, sudden economic declines in China, in Europe, in North America. And those economic declines have had much amplified effects on Africa um, because they've been transmitted through three different routes, each of which is really big. One is commodities, commodity prices. Commodity prices have suddenly collapsed. You just have to look at the oil price. Beginning of the year, it was $80. It's now struggling somewhere around 30, right? Um, that's a huge loss of revenue. And it's true of most commodities. Right? So there's a, and most Africa is basically, that's what it depends upon for, for its exports, is commodity exports, very heavily. Um, the second route, uh, is remittances. Africa gets a lot of remittances, more than aid. Right? It's, this is its own population abroad, the diaspora, sending money. And usually, when times get particularly tough in Africa, the diaspora increases its charitable remittances because they know that hardship's gone. This time, they can't. Why? Because a lot of the African diaspora is in the jobs where um, there's now mass unemployment. They're being laid off. They're being in short time. And so the, the capacity of the diaspora to make these remittances has gone down just when they're needed. And the third route is Africa's a big travel destination, tourism and such like. That's gone suddenly to zero. All three are the main routes by which Africa gets uh, income from abroad foreign exchange and they've all collapsed at the same time that's a huge shock not only that but they're a source of a lot of government revenue and so just as the uh, incomes in the economy have collapsed so the fiscal revenue the tax revenue of the government's collapsed and so the government is in no position to um, to cushion the economy um, in Europe and America, the OECD, the average fiscal response has been something like 7 to 10 percentage points of GDP increase in fiscal deficit. You know? In Africa, uh, the latest figures I saw was 0.8% of GDP because they have no fiscal space. And so, yes, we've been quite negligent. Fortunately, IMF... World Bank, they're very well read, and they're doing the right thing. The president of the World Bank just appealed today to say, we've, you know, we've not got enough firepower. We need more money. The 60 million people are going to be plunged into severe poverty as a result of this. So they're, they're doing the right thing. They need um, you know, the governments of the uh, rich economies um, and of course, the governments of the rich economies don't feel very rich at the moment, but, um, but we do need to help those that are in such dire difficulties. And then as for Europe, as for the European Union, this is a crisis which also uh, fuels sentiments of coming together by national societies, health systems, and this is the core of solidarity and, and existential feelings at the same time there is an attempt for Europe, the European Union, to mobilize solidarity within. But this is, is this a zero-sum game? Is, it, is this crisis strengthening into your view, kind of national sentiments, feelings of belonging at home with the EU becoming irrelevant? Or is it going to show people that at the end they need to practice solidarity at a higher level if they want to be efficient? Well, that's the question, isn't it? We don't know. Um, we see what's in play um, and it's very unclear what will, you know, uh, will the European Commission be permitted to, to borrow uh, $500 billion um, and use it for grants? Um, if it does, 
where will those grants go? Um, you know, I mean, so far, the European Commission has been active in um, relaxing uh, restrictions on um, national governments, and half of all that relaxation has been Germany as a beneficiary, right? So, um, you know, at the moment, the European com community has been very good for one country. Um, to his great credit, um, Olaf Scholz, the, uh, the German finance minister, is actively now trying to, um, uh, to move Germany towards generosity. And um, that is, uh, you know, in the German context, that's a courageous thing to do. Um, um, so I'm, I know him and I, you know, I, I admire him a lot for, 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 for his courage here. Um, and let's hope he wins. Um, uh, so far, um, things, you know, things haven't looked pretty, have they? But um, I think, um, uh, you know, there used to be a phrase that said the Americans always, this was a Churchill phrase, the Americans always do the right thing, but only after first exploring every other possibility. <laughs> um, and let's hope that that kind of applies in Europe, you know. It's, they're certainly exploring every other possibility. <laughs> Okay, great. So, um, you know, we've, we've, we've come to the end of our interview. Um, you know, I just, uh, I've read your writing that, uh, quote, what began as the coronavirus has morphed into a COVID-19 as journalists schooling the humanities have coded the commentaries in a technocratic veneer. How have I done there? <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed writing that. <laughs> I know, it was, it was a very nice lash uh, yeah. to <laughs> running commentary. Um, and of course, um, I'm as guilty as anybody, because uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not a, a, a medic, but I, I am proud of one thing. So I, I wrote this critique of the use of the epidemiological models, and Oxford University has uh, about a finest community of medical ep epide epidemiologists I can't even say it, in, in the world. Uh, and they've just invited me to address them because <laughs> they really, really liked what you said. <laughs> so <laughs> so, uh, so okay. I don't know, you know. But, um, um, I think there's, it's, there's one healthy sign is this recognition that you can't say we're just following the science. Yeah. There's a big gap between what scientists do and turning that into the choices and trade-offs involved in public yeah. policy. We really need to get better at that. Okay, that's, I think that's a beautiful ending. Uh, and then we hope to see you soon around in, in Madrid to present your book, Greed is Dead. You know, we, we, we're very much you know, forward looking to, to, to read and see you here, to read your book and see you here in Madrid. Well, I so enjoyed my last visit to Madrid. Uh, you know, as soon as things open up, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Diopoli. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>